All right. Um, am I audible at the moment? Yes. All right. Then uh, I think we can uh, start today's uh, webinar. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, whether you're in Indonesia, in the Netherlands, or elsewhere, to already the fourth of the webinars in a series of five. Uh, in this series, Museum at Schip joins forces with Heritage Hands on Pusat Documentatie Architecture and Yaya San Museum Architecture Indonesia to explore the interrelations between architecture, design, and uh, in, in Indonesia and the Netherlands by inviting heritage experts, historians, architects, curators, and artists. Um, I will quickly uh, introduce myself. My name is Melle van Mane, uh, and I uh, have curated the exhibition Indonesia and Amsterdam School in Museum at Schip. And this exhibition is also the reason for us organizing this webinar series. So um, you know a little bit about me now. Um, note that this webinar is being recorded uh, because we put up every webinar uh, on our website so people can uh, look at it afterwards. So uh, please be aware of this. Um, and in today's webinar, we have invited again several speakers uh, to join us. Um, and for the introduction, I will gladly give uh, Gadis Vitrana Putri the floor. Uh, she will be our moderator for today, and uh, Addis is an independent conservator and researcher with interest in technical art history of Southeast Asian visual arts and material culture. Uh, she studied cultural material conservation at the University of Melbourne, and recently Addis was research associate at NICAS, the Netherlands Institute for, uh, Netherlands Institute for Conservation Art uh, and Science. And um, she was very happily part of the uh, research and curatorial team for the exhibition Indonesian Amsterdam School. Um, so uh, yeah, um, I think we can start. Uh, maybe Addis, you can inform us about the program and announce the speakers for today. Thank you so much for the introduction, Mela. And I'd like to say welcome to everyone who has joined the room and also um, a hello for a future audience watching the recorded version of this session through our website. And uh, it's an honor of mine to chair today's uh, webinar session titled Batik in Motion Between Heritage, Artistic Practice and Design in Indonesia and the Netherlands. And as the title suggests, in this fourth installment of our webinar program, we would like to take a deeper look into one uh, of the many sources of inspiration that a lot of Dutch designers and Amsterdam school artists of the time, so um, late 19th to early 20th century, uh, took from. And um, we would like to expand on this Batik Aksen example because um, if, uh, in our current exhibition, we paid a particular interest on um, the appreciation that Dutch designers and Amsterdam school artists um, have uh, upon arts of crafts. And in their minds, factories and machines could never match the beauty of uh, craft, uh, craftsmanship. And on this, um, at that time, uh, they were exposed to a lot of not only exhibitions that is happening uh, in the Netherlands, but also trips to uh, the former uh, Dutch uh, colony um, in former Dutch East Indies. So uh, today we, will, we would like to look at Batik as a case study um, amongst the other Indonesian cultural material influences um, that proliferated here, such as wicker work and um, also dance. Uh, so the intangible uh, heritage as well. And we would like to explore the question such as um, how we see Batik as heritage um, and cultural practices and design processes, not only uh, on that time, but also continuing until today, hence Batik in motion. And we'll hear more from our panel of speakers. We have in the room now with us, Sabine Wolk, Amanda Pinati, and Professor Lila Kornia. And we are also very glad that we have uh, Ardi Hariadi, the current junior curator of uh, Museum Textile Jakarta. And which will be here uh, with us to share his thoughts and insights during the discussion portion of the session. But um, moreover, we are very curious to hear from you, our audience, 
um, what you think on this bigger question surrounding artistic practices, heritage, freedom versus um, this idea of appreciation versus uh, appropriation um, of visual language and techniques from other culture and how do people work, engage, or see Batik nowadays, um, both as the public, as practitioners, or as institutions, museums, and galleries? Um, but before we start, I would like to make a small announcement. Um, we'll open the floor for conversations and Q&A after all of our speakers conclude their presentations. But in the meantime, I would like to encourage everyone to write your thoughts, comments, or questions in the chat box. And if you feel more comfortable writing either in Dutch or Indonesian, um, please do so. Uh, we will do our best to facilitate a multi-language discussion, so don't be shy. Um, uh, and also, uh, last announcement, um, for those that would like to receive a digital certificate of attendance to this webinar, please send uh, us an email. The museum has given an email with details that uh, I hope my colleague will put um, the instruction on how to in the chat box. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Sabine to the floor uh, and I will introduce um, Sabine is a Dutch artist and um, research, Batik researcher who has been exploring this uh, Batik, the Batik as practice since 2009. Uh, she documents her research on her blog, The Journey of Batik, and recently launched a project, a research project on retelling the history of the Indo-European influence on Batik. And Sabine was a research associate at the Research Center for Material Culture in Leiden from 2019 to the end of 2021, researching on Batik collections that exist in Dutch Museum and Archives collection. So I think for today, uh, Sabine will share um, a look into the historical development of Batik from, from the 19th century. Um, and uh, yeah, this um, topic surrounding imitations or uh, the thing that widely uh, known as Batik Belanda and uh, just um, exploring the other influences from uh, abroad or a European influence that exists in uh, Japanese Baltic at that time. So yeah, without further ado, Sabine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I will uh, start sharing my screen. Is my presentation there? Okay, good to know. Uh, welcome everyone. Today I'd like to share more on the development of Batik in the 19th century and my recent research project, as Addis already told, um, the retelling of the history of the Indo-European influence on Batik. In my research project, the goal is to retell the history of the Indo-European influence on Batik between 1850 and 1890. Uh, I choose this time frame because according to literature, this is when a European influence became visible in Batik designs. In my research, I work with retelling to give answers in words and images to the following question. How was Batik influenced by Europe? Uh, we will take a closer look at the history. Oh, wait, cannot move my, <laughs> sorry. We will take a closer look at the history and development of Batik in the 19th century. Here, a photo of the Regency Kudus, the Bupati and his family, all dressed in traditional Sokan colored kind panjans that we still know today from cities like Solo and Yogyakarta. The photo is from around 1870, and uh, while the Batik Motas from the Kraton kept mostly the same throughout the last two centuries, Batik throughout Java and especially the north coast of Java changed a lot. Before we dive into the Batiks made in the 19th century, I first want to start with this map. The history of Batik is very much a global history, um, so a map of what is where is a good start, I think. So first, uh, let me share where I am. I'm the blue dot, uh, the Netherlands. Um, here is Java, probably where a lot of you uh, tune in from. Here is uh, the West Coast of Af Africa, specifically Ghana. Um, here's where the Suez Canal opened in 1869. Here's England, and then last on the map, I put Suriname. Uh, which was a former Dutch colony where, among other things, cotton was grown on plantations. I placed these dots on a map showing places in the world where the Dutch had a significant influence. Marked in black and gray are places that were colonized by the Dutch or where the Dutch set up trading posts. As you can see, already as early as the 17th century, the Dutch had an impact on many places in the world. 
and with this history, we are still dealing today. The main reason the Dutch were at all these locations was trade. In the 17th century, the company VEC and VOC were started up with a focus on making money for the Netherlands. In this map, you see the trading routes of the Verenigde oost Indies Company, of in, or in English, Dutch East India Company. And in the small map, uh, you see the route before the Suez Canal opened. The ship had to go around the African continent to go to Asia. It would stock up along the way uh, or trade in West Africa and South Africa. The VOC traded a lot of textiles. Uh, Indian, Indian textiles were very popular and were brought by the VOC from India to the Netherlands, but also to Indonesia. When the VOC was declared bankrupt at the end of the 18th century, there were less Indian textiles coming into Indonesia. We think this sparked the demand in Batik. Indian motifs like find in uh, patola or chins were copied using the batik technique. Here is a beautiful example of a batik with a patola motif from the 19th century. I want to share a little bit more about my research and my work method. My research starting point was and is Caroline Josefine van Frankemon. Van Frankemon is a well-known name within the batik community. In literature it is written that she was the first in the European to run a batik workshop around 1850 on Java in Indonesia. That she was locally known under the name Pankmon and famous for a green dye. Here are several batiks from several collections attributed to Van Frankmon. Attributed as in thought to be made by her or made in her workshop. Van Frankmon did not sign her batiks and almost all of these attributions were made decades after her death in 1867. To retell the history of Indo-European influence on Batik, I use as a starting point the story about and Batik's attributed to Van Frankman. Uh, I started mapping out what is called or seen as a Dutch, a European or Indo-European influence on Japanese Batik. How is it described in literature? What sources are there? And who wrote what, when, and very important, why? Um, in the European influence is usually linked uh, in literature to Van Frankman, but can this influence truly be traced back to one individual? Were there other factors playing a role in this development? Uh, let's take a closer look. In the 19th century, the interest for batik in Europe grew. Museums started buying batiks. Batiks were shown during colonial exhibitions and people, uh, mostly white Dutch men, started researching batik. Here on the photo, you see a display made by Gerrit Pieter Rouvaar in 1900 uh, to launch his research for a book. The book with the title Batik Art from Indonesia and Her History was published in 1914. The book is still seen today as an important source for information on batik. Here, a page from his manuscript. Uh, Rouvaar was the first to write about Van Frankemon. I marked it here in Green. He writes in, the, in his book in more extent about her and his writings on her and the bats he attributes started a century long fascination. In the 1990s, the book Batu Belanda got published by Harmer Veldhuizen. The book describes a specific uh, style within Batik that was made for and worn by Europeans and Indo Europeans in the former Dutch East Indies. Van Frankman is put in the book as the starter of this trend, as the so-called mother of Batik Belanda. A large part of the Veldhuis collection uh, ended up in the Tropenmuseum. The other part went to Donna Hardy, uh, the private uh, Batik Museum in Solo on Java. Uh, they have nowadays a special room dedicated to Batik Belanda, as you can see here on the photos. And um, I took these photos, by the way, with permission in 2019. Uh, the book Batik Belanda later gets published also in Bahasa Indonesia. You see the cover here on the right. If you Google the term Batik Belanda today, this is what you see online. Um, Veldhuis coined the term Batik Belanda, but the term was actually not used in the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century for Batik. The growing interest in Europe for Batik in the 19th century was not just because 
because they thought it was beautiful. They thought Batik was also an interesting business opportunity. When Tom, Thomas Stanford Raffles described the Batik technique in his book, The History of Java, published in 1870, Raffles did this because he thought it would be a good idea to make imitations. These imitations would be made in England and then shipped to Asia to be sold there. Other cotton printing companies started making these fake batiks as well and shipped them to Southeast Asia. Here on the photo of an example of such an imitation, uh, this one is made in Rotterdam, uh, the Netherlands, by the Kralingse Katoen Maatschappij. From the 1850s onward, uh, imitation bats were made in the Netherlands, Switzerland, France, and England. These imitations from Europe or fake batiks became known as batik belanda. Here you see an advertisement selling batik belanda among other things. The imitation batiks were partly made by machine and partly by hand. The machines had copper rolls that would print a motif on it uh, using a kind of resin. The blue was dyed in a color bath and other colors were added with block printing. Here a photo of the Dutch cotton printer. Uh, he's adding the colors with a wooden stamp. In response to these cheaper fake batiks, the batik chop industry on Java grew halfway through the 19th century. Batik chop was faster to produce than batik tules. It was therefore also cheaper. Batik chop was great for competing with imitations from Europe. The imitations were cheap, but people on Java preferred real batik. They would buy batik chop or save money to buy batik tulis. The European cotton printers were baffled that their cheap mass-produced imitations wouldn't sell. It was actually an early form of fast fashion and wasn't so successful. I have here a nice quote by Van Musselbroek from 1878 in which he describes the imitations. But keep in mind, always as imitation, Batik Tiron or Batik Walanda, Dutch Batik, a Batik of its own kind. Never did Japanese people see the imitations for real Japanese Batik. Another development from Europe that influenced Batik was plain woven cotton. The cotton produced with forced labor from Suriname and the United States was woven in Europe in the 19th century with machines. The machines at the end of the 19th century could make a much finer, thinner cloth. This fine woven cotton was perfect for drawing the fine lines using the chanting, the wax pen. This resulted in the finest batik tulis at the end of the 19th century. Here, an example of such a batik. Uh, the cotton of this batik is very fine, and as you can see, it's very detailed. This was bought between 1874 and 1877 by Elie van Rijkenforsel during his travels on Java. With the research I did on uh, batiks attributed to Van Frankman, I noticed how important it is to know the wearer. Batiks in museum collection often have limited provenance, especially if it's bought from a collector. But if it's donated by a person, the family tree can sometimes provide some insights. Not always is written down if the person who donated the batiks actually wore them themselves, but if family members did live in the former Dutch East Indies, it's possible the batiks might have been worn by them. Uh, let me take you through an example. Uh, when I started my research within the museum collections, I looked up every piece that was attributed to Van Frank Mon, and this one showed up in the digital database. The sarong was donated in 1960. Uh, here's the inventory card. The textile cultivator of the Troop Museum attributes it to Van Frank Mon. It seems solely based on the greenish blue background. There's no other data provided that is actually by this workshop. Because the batik seem to be worn, sewn on top is an added piece of bright red cotton, as you can see. I looked up uh, the person who donated it. To my surprise, no less than 41 pieces were donated by this one person. Here a little overview. The pieces were donated by Jungfrau Anna Cecile Aurelia Jean Clifford. Jungfrau as in damsel. Not the usual wardrobe you think of for a lady that apparently never been to Indonesia herself. Although the bats are diverse in style, they seem to be from a similar time frame. Uh, there are North Coast bat batiks like this one with bright red. And then there are batiks like this one in Sogan colors. I think the divide is about 50-50. We know Lily, 
for sure, never went to Indonesia, but her mother, Theodora, was born there. Meet Theodora Lammers van Torenborg, for short, Dora, the mother of Lily. On this photo made in 1869, Dora is about 17 years old. A girl of Asian descent dressed European. I think Dora was the wearer of these batiks. Although till now the collection has been seen as an ethnographic collection from a noble family. The provenance data from early Batic history is limited. And we have to remember the history was written down by those who were in power. From most Batiks, we don't know who wore them or who made them for that matter. Photographs can be a useful way of finding out who wears were too. This often give a more diverse or different story than the stories that have been written down. This uh, photo is from around 1900. And what I like about this photo is that everyone is wearing a different style batik and kabaya or top. The woman holding the cat is wearing a batik we would see today as influenced by the Dutch. It is a drintin batik or kaboon binatang, a zoo batik. We think these designs became popular at the, when the first zoo was opened on Java in 1864. So we can consider this motif as a European influence. Uh, let's look at some more batiks with a European influence and their wearers in photos. Another much written about Dutch influence in batik are fairy tales. Here are batik from around 1900 showing Little Red Riding Hood, Boatkapje. In a book by Feldhuizen, it is described as a design typically worn by European or Indo-European women, and it was a, and it, that it was a popular engagement gift. The only photos I found of people wearing the batiks, however, are not European or Indo-European. Here an example. In the photo, we see a Japanese man and woman. Uh, the Japanese woman is wearing a batik with the fairy tale Little Red Riding Hood on it. In the white, you can still see the wolf. The, this batik is designed by Jans, uh, Adelheid Veenstra Jans. It's described as the only batik entrepreneur on Java with both parents born in the Netherlands. In the badan, uh, the big part on the right is a so-called parang motif, um, uh, which is a kratel motif, uh, while on the left in the kapala is an image that looks like a painting that was most likely copied from a Jap uh, Japanese artwork. The borders have a motif very similar to the lace on a kabaya. According to literature, the batiks by Jans were made for a European clientele on Java. Uh, nowadays, I think this is an example of fashion we would discuss as cultural appreciation versus appropriation. Here, a photo of a wearer of a very similar batik. This photo is from 1930s, and it shows a group of women described as Indo-Chinese. The woman in the center wears a very similar uh, batik as designed by Jans. This batik we know as batik poem or tabe nona tabe. Uh, batik, poem, uh, batik with a poem on it in Malay about saying goodbye. In most books, this type of batik is said to be given as a goodbye gift given by husbands or fiancés in an often European context. While there are several pieces kept with this poem in Dutch collections, I have till now only found one photo of a wearer. This photo was made in a photo studio and the gentleman is wearing a batik poem. It could be that he was dressed up specifically for this photo. So we have to keep in mind that when using photographs as um, sources, it could have been, uh, yeah, like a photo studio situation. As the last part of my retelling, I would like to share a new discovery I made. Um, in literature, it's mentioned that fairy tales batiks are based on actual fairy tale drawings. However, nobody have linked original drawings to batiks until now. Here you see a couple of examples of batiks with the fairy tale Snow White on it. Nieuwetje. There are several versions of this batik signed by different makers, which have all the same kind of story uh, line and images. When I saw in an exhibition about Art Nouveau, an illustration book of Snow White, I looked it up online. And it turned out to be the book the batiks were based on. The book is illustrated by artists, Dutch artist Wilhelmina Cornelia Drupstein, 
and was published in Dutch and English in 1906. So we know now that the batiks with Snow White were designed after 1906. Have some more comparisons. And of course, the highlight of the book, The Awakening of Snow White. Uh, it happens by a kiss on her hand, and the writing explains the prince barely touched her and she already opens her eyes. And um, the illustration was copied in the Vatic with even more room between the prince's lips and Snow White's hand, which I thought was a nice detail. Um, these photos are all from a Vatic signed by Weber. Uh, Batik entrepreneur Wilhelmina Frederike Beer passed away in 1908. The book came out in 1906. This tells us there must have been almost a direct connection between the Netherlands and the Dutch East Indies at that point to turn this uh, fairy tale book into a Batik. When I look at how Batiks are displaced now, I think we might show Batiks from the past differently in the future. I hope my presentation will make you look in a different way to this past and will maybe inspire you to dive into the, this topic as well. As always, I like to end my talk with thanking the Batik makers, those of the past and the present. Without them, I would not have been able to share these amazing stories with you here today. So thank you, Karima Kasibanyak. Thank you, Luel. Thank you so much, Sabine, for sharing with us your current and ongoing research. I am excited to know more about how, yeah, your findings, uh, both inside the museum collection, but also um, your interaction with the makers themselves. So thank you again for your presentation. And uh, next, I would like to um, introduce you. Well, before that, I think, um, uh, Sabine have uh, given us a great overview as well uh, on this one side of what is happening uh, during this um, back and forth interaction, uh, the cultural exchange and yeah, influences between the Netherlands, uh, Europe, Netherlands and Indonesia. Um, but what is happening at that, during that period in the Netherlands, because um, they're from the 1900s to 1950, uh, many museums in the Netherlands start to um, exhibit uh, and showcase the art and design from outside Europe and that uh, help proliferate this um, idea of uh, the, the Oriental art and, and gain more uh, attraction um, amongst the um, European artists uh, towards uh, this new visuals. And um, on that time, uh, Batik also became uh, increasingly popular uh, amongst the new Newlands or the Dutch Art Nouveau movement. Um, and uh, on this, um, designer curator Amanda Pinati, um, our next speaker, I would like to invite Amanda to the floor. Um, hi, Amanda. Hi, hello. Good to have you here. So uh, Amanda will discuss how and why some of the objects that got inspired uh, from uh, you know, uh, batik uh, that was made uh, by uh, the Dutch designer uh, got uh, its way into um, the Stedelijk Museum's collection and how it is being displayed today. Uh, so just to give a little bit of um, introduction, uh, Amanda, Amade Ngura Amanda Binati is the design creator at the Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam and uh, her work explores the intersection of political, social, decolonial, environmental, and economic issues in, to stimulate participative insights and to shed new lights on historical collections inside the museum for younger generations. And Amanda is currently also a PhD candidate at the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam, uh, where uh, she researches the affordances of, of objects uh, within this idea of uh, contested um, belongings. So, um, Without further ado, the floor is yours, Amanda. Thank you. I will also share my screen. Let me see. I hope you can see this all. There we are. Can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Well, 
Thank you um, so much for the introduction. As said, I'm design curator um, at the Stalic, where I started working in February uh, 2020, which is, of course, as you know, a bit of a strange time to start a new job, as I think I was there for two weeks and then I was sent home again because of COVID. <laughs> but I would like to dive into how Dutch artists and designers in the early 1900s appropriated Batik in a lot of different designs and how and why these objects found their way into the permanent collection display yesterday, today, that opened last year. Um, well, when I arrived at the Stedelijk, the collection presentation was still in the lower level gallery, uh, or was then called base. And uh, this is uh, what it looked like. Along the outer walls, as you can see on the left, um, the artworks hung close together, forming a timeline, which was always one work per year, and it was arranged chronologically. And on these slanted steel walls, various ensembles of works could be seen, originating from certain art movements or periods. So also the Amsterdam School, Rietveld, color field painting, expressionism, uh, etc. And the visitors got the feeling of walking into the depot of the museum. And it was, of course, reinforced architecturally by the fact that they walked into the basement. So that's why we called it uh, base. Um, but Rein Wolf, who was appointed as director in December 2019, wanted a new collection presentation, which is normally the case, of course, when there's a new director, they want to sort of put their own mark on their institution. And he also wanted to move the collection back into the monumental building. So that lower level gallery, which you just saw, could be used again for temporary exhibitions. And this is actually how the building was originally intended. So we created a new display. Um, I did that with the whole team of curators, and we decided to divide the collection in three different time frames. And we started with the collection of 1980 to now, because it felt a little bit uh, maybe easiest. <laughs> and then we moved back in time. So there's a part that is uh, divided as in collection 1950 to 1980, and the last is the collection until 1950. And in the new collection presentation, we really wanted to step away from this idea of show, showing icons of having only one hegemonic art history, but actually showing um, multiple histories of art at the same time uh, that are connected to societal concerns. So the whole presentation, over the whole collection presentation, so all the time periods are uh, theme-based. And it thinks from the idea of transformations. So themes that we found relevant and urgent are amongst others, colonialism, decolonialism, globalization, migration, climate crisis, et cetera. And especially in the last part that we worked on, or actually the first part that is that you can see now at the Stalic, so uh, the collection before 1950, um, this direct influence of colonialism and migration play a big role as they were very profound at the time. And here you can see um, one of the, the rooms already of this uh, Yesterday Today collection presentation. And this is also the room that I uh, want to talk to you about. So in the late 19th century and first half of the 20th century, artists in, uh, in Europe were fascinated by the range of cultures that colonialism brought them into contact with. And uh, some even traveled to the colonies, like Sabine also said. As we know, Chris Lebeau, of whom you see some work here, it's uh, quite small, it's on the left in the vitrine. It's a, it's a book, and he batted the cover. Uh, but he, was, he spent half a year in Indonesia in 1914. Uh, but many other artists also adapted their themes as a result of their exposure to these foreign countries and, and peoples. And a number appropriated the visual language and materials of these cultures. Uh, such as the Batiks, of course, of Indonesia, but also sculptures of the Bamileke in Cameroon and the Edo of the Kingdom of Benin in present-day Nigeria. So colonial power relations led to many of these sculptures winding up in European ethnographic museums, but none in uh, modern art museums. Here on the, on the left, you can see a, a sculpture, actually two sculptures, but those were made um, by artists from the Bruke. So not artists from uh, Nigeria, Cameroon. Um, and works by uh, European artists are often, well, they actually often romanticize 
life in southern regions, especially in Arabian countries and in Southeast Asia. So movements known today as Orientalism and Moy India, a romanticized style of paintings of what was then um, the Dutch East Indies, emerged. Uh, which gave a very one-dimensional picture of cultures, people, and landscapes. And here you can see the, the gallery that is called Modernism and Colonialism in this new collection display. And um, as you can see, there is a, a sort of island where with several Baltic objects made by Dutch designers and artists are shown. And they are surrounded by works of Picasso, and that you see on the right side, Matisse and Kirchner. So as you might know, the Stedelijk Museum opened its doors um, in 1895. And from then to the 1960s, it regularly held exhibitions of art and design from outside of Europe, but very much seen from a European, a European uh, viewpoint. And an important area of focus was art from Indonesia. And between 1901 and 1962, there were 25 exhibitions on Indonesian objects and art. Um, these were colonial exhibitions such as the Colonial Adaiskundige Tentoonstelling, so the exhibition of colonial geography in 1913, but also the Tentoonstelling Ter Herdenking van het 300-jarig bestaan van Batavia, an exhibition to commemorate the 300th uh, anniversary of present day Jakarta in 1919. And the AO took place at the Stedelijk, in, in addition to exhibitions of arts and uh, crafts from the region. And these were curated by different Dutch associations or by the Stedelijk curators. And in 1900, the World Exhibition took place in Paris. And the Netherlands launched a Dutch East Indies pavilion, which had an emphasis on cultural history. And even the Javanese temple Chandisari was recreated. But because a few Dutch people could travel to Paris to admire this pavilion, it was decided to bring the contents of the pavilion to the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam so that more countrymen could enjoy the splendor of the colony. So here on this photo, you can see uh, Queen Wilhelmina and Prince Hendrik visiting the exhibition in 1901. And also, as you can see, they're surrounded by numerous objects variating from batiks, sculptures and mosques. And really every inch of the exhibition space is used uh, even the doorposts are lined with uh, with masks. But none of these works or objects from this particular Indische tentoonstelling in the Stedelijk Museum or the other 24 uh, exhibitions were acquired for our collection. So our current collection does not reflect the exhibition policy at that time. Uh, Indonesian objects were shown at modern art museums, but mostly ended up in ethnographic museums like the Volkkunde Museum in Leiden, or the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam, then called the Colonial Museum. From 1932 to 1952, the Stedelijk did house the Museum for Asian Art, uh, which was located in uh, what then was called the Garden Room. And this part of the museum was devoted to art objects that were also recognized as such in their countries of origin, as opposed to everyday objects collected by ethnographic museums, like I just said. And they were um, primarily, housed, primarily housed works by artists that employed centuries old practices. The collection in its entirety moved to the Rijksmuseum in 1952, where it remains on permanent display. So again, none of these objects was acquired for the collection of the Stedelijk. So as you all know, uh, batik is an Indonesian resist dyeing technique used for decorating textiles. It's uh, safe, guarded cultural heritage, and of course, still holds an important significance for several islands in Indonesia. It's widely worn today, and it also plays a central role on special occasions. And as Sabine just said, in the 20th century, Europeans and inner Europeans in Indonesia began wearing different motives. But this was done also to set themselves apart from the local population. But around that same time, artists and designers in the Netherlands learned about batik in places like the ethnographic museum at Artis, the Amsterdam Zoo, but also through the aforementioned exhibitions with objects from Indonesia at the Stedelijk. And batik became very popular in the Nieuwe Kunst, so the, new, the Dutch brands of um, Art Nouveau, and designers and artists such as Gerrit Willem Dijsselhoff, Chris Lebeau, 
and Ramil Daily appropriated the technique by applying it to all kinds of objects, from book bindings to furniture. Karel Adolf Leon Cachet became acquainted with Batik in this um, ethnographic museum in artist, and he directly began to experiment with the techniques himself. And those early Dutch Batiks were intended to serve as wall hangings, so not to be worn. And also Dijsseldorf um, joined him in making these wall hangings. But eventually these artists decided that it was too difficult to batik large pieces of textiles and they began to apply the technique on all sorts of materials. So this room uh, you see here shows different batik objects from our collection. In 1934, we uh, the Stelex started collecting Dutch um, uh, design and also then uh, international design later. So these are all acquired a bit in a later period. But maybe the most remarkable piece is the closet made by uh, Louise Bochtman. You can see only the back on this photo, but I'll show you a better photo of it later. Um, this was a recent acquisition, but he applied batik on wood. So not a, on textile anymore, but on wood, which of course is a, a very different take on this technique. Uh, but it was not only uh, batik that he used. Bochtman also appropriated the Indonesian ikat weaving um, technique to make rocks. And as Sabine also just said, the batik inspired uh, a new technique, the wax print, so this imitation batik. And this process for making imitation batiks was developed in the Netherlands in the 19th century. Um, the textiles were intended for Indonesia, where Dutch traders believed they could earn a really handsome profit off the copies. Um, the patterns at first um, were initially one-to-one uh, -one copies. But like Sabine also said, the Japanese were very much dissat dissatisfied with the quality and the cloths were shipped on to West Africa, which is the largest market for uh, wax prints today. And the most well-known producer is the Dutch company Flisco. And in 2013, the Stelic acquired some Flisco fabrics of which the patterns were designed by Dutch graphic designer Michiel Schuurman. And you can see it hanging next to the batiks in the same gallery space uh, over here as a uh, transhistoric moment. But uh, we don't only see this appropriation in batik, but also in uh, how the Netherlands appropriates artists themselves. Uh, born on Java to a Norwegian Japanese father and British Indonesian Chinese mother, the multicultural identity of painter Jan Torop has remained largely underappreciated until now. Torop um, is chiefly regarded as a Dutch symbolist and is often placed entirely within the European art tradition. I guess due to the shock of Indonesian independence, he was written in art history as Dutch and his association with Indonesia is mostly concealed. And this makes it seem as if colonial links appeared spontaneously in the Netherlands. Um, yet inspiration does not tra traverse the world on its own. It travels really with makers and objects. And here you can see a portrait of uh, on the left of Jan Torop, which is made by Jean uh, Biruma Oosting. And on the right, you can see a bit of a close up of this uh, wooden wardrobe by uh, Bochtman. And although Indonesia was not per se a subject of his work, Toro purposely allowed his background to influence his paintings and Art Nouveau style posters uh, from around 1900, the one that you can also see here on the right. Uh, the shadow play of uh, Wyon puppets, for instance, inspired this sinuous geometric lines of his work. And he said, the Indies have meant a great deal to me. I cannot imagine myself without the Indies. Well, to counter the colonial view from the European artists in in the rooms, I, in the room I just showed you, uh, in the next two rooms, several themes within the extensive history of anti-colonial resistance are explored uh, through works also from our collection. Uh, the longer narrative of resistance are told through uh, events and historical persons, predominantly from Indonesian and Surinamese perspectives, like activist and writer Anton de Kom, writer, poet, and politician Rustam Effendi, but also activist, writer, columnist, uh, politician Ki Hajar Devantara, and a print of him and of one of his wife of the woodcuts made by Chris Lebeau are also shown in this room. And by connecting these two former Dutch colonies, so Indonesia 
and Suriname, uh, we want to demonstrate how there had been resistance from the very beginning in both places that has suffered from colonization. And this re resistance varied in form, intensity, and effectiveness, but was actually always present. Eventually, it led to the independence of both nations. And as a nod to the room before, you can also see two angisas. These are the textiles here um, on the left. And they are worn on the head, it's a, it's a headscarf, and they're designed by Dutch graphic designer Farida Sedok in 2021 in honor of Keti Koti, the celebration of the uh, abolition of slavery. So these two textile works, they refer to the transatlantic textile trade that was conducted by the Netherlands with Indonesia and West Africa. Um, but these textiles do not only play a role in this as a consumer item, it also is really a, a bearer of meaning because printed fabrics can be seen as an archive that stores a country's memory, as well as the global connections that have contributed to the formation of national identity. Uh, and when worn on the body, of course, like batik is intended to, these fabrics connect the personal with the collective of society. And based on this textile history, Farida Sadok reveals the dynamics between cultural heritage, political power structures, money, and globalization. Well, I think it's, uh, it's clear that Indonesia's desire for independence did not appear overnight. It was um, stoked by outside influences, but it was a struggle that had been waged for centuries. And it reached its communica uh, culmination in 1945 through a combination of factors that resulted in a power vacuum. And it's similar to Suriname's fight for freedom from colonialism, uh, which also smoldered for centuries and was eventually realized in 1975. And um, these are works by Agus and Otto Jaya, and they are really fueled by the Indonesian War of Independence that um, started with the pro proclamation of the Republic of Indonesia in 1945. And this struggle is clearly depicted in several works of them, where Dutch colonialism is represented as a monster. And between 1947 and 1950, uh, the two brothers, Otto and Agus Jaya, lived in Europe and mostly in the Netherlands. And here they secretly reproduced propaganda for Indonesian independence. So through their paintings, they sought to convince the Dutch uh, here in the Netherlands of Indonesians' right to independence. So the revolutionaries were really well aware of the power of the image. And back in Indonesia, Agus began building a national art collection. Uh, but in 1947, so really in the midst of Indonesian war, in, um, in the Indonesian War of Independence, Stalic director William Sandberg organized the debut exhibition of Agus and Otto Jaya in the Netherlands. And it was actually the first time a solo show of contemporary extra European artists was held at the museum. And luckily, six works were acquired for the collection. So like I said, we didn't um, collect any of the Batik sculptures or masks that were shown between 1900 and um, 1950. But in 1947, these um, six works did um, yeah, get into the, to our collection. So I'm really happy with that. I'm really happy that I can show them here. Um, but to go back to Batik, I really wanted to show the, the Dutch Batik objects from our collection in our new collection presentation in this room together with artworks of Picasso and Kirchner. Um, because of course, we can really celebrate the artistic value of these works. But I think at the same time, we can also look critically at the artist, because I wonder why did they think they could appropriate images and techniques from other countries? And in the case of Bochman and Leon Cachet, was it because Indonesia was simply seen as Dutch property, so there was no problem in copying uh, Batik? So to think about this question again, cultural appreciation or cultural appropriation, I don't really see the use of uh, batik by Dutch designers and artists as cross-pollination because there was no balanced relation of give and take. There was an asymmetrical violent power dimension. So appropriation has been really institutionalized, uh, not only of culture, but also of land and lives, as the case with Indonesia. Many European laws were written to ban certain uh, rituals and ceremonies in colonies around the globe to enable them to steal artifacts from these colonies that then ended up in ethnographic European museums. 
Uh, but I definitely also don't believe in cancel culture. And I find it really important to display um, this development in Dutch arts and crafts, precisely to show how much Indonesia has influenced Indonesia, uh, the Netherlands. And why I added the Flisco uh, in this room is actually to show that coloniality and the profit from colonial times still very much lives on today. So culture is still treated as a resource to be extracted. And that's something Farida Sadok also shows us in her uh, Angisas. Um, so yeah, I guess we should make the idea of this artistic freedom a bit more complex and take ownership into account and really introduce the three R's. So respect, responsibility, and reciprocity. And that's uh, all I wanted to uh, say now. Um, and I look forward to uh, discussing uh, later on. Thank you, Amanda. And I am sincerely also looking forward to continuing the discussion because you you touched on a lot of important point, I guess, uh, the, the current discussion that is happening everywhere, at least uh, from what I get here in Europe and in the Netherlands, where do you draw the line between appreciation, inspiration, and um, appropriation? And also, I have this question for you later, um, where, where um, museums and galleries take role, um, take part in this role um, of yeah, this dynamic. But for now, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, and now we're moving on to our uh, third speaker of the day. Um, and uh, for this, just to make a, a smooth uh, transition, um, I also really like that uh, Amanda mentioned uh, this idea of Batik uh, sort of um, exists as a heritage object, a heritage with a capital H, something that is quite, um, I guess, unchanging or, or needing a preservation and um, which can tie it uh, to become uh, sort of like a national identity, especially in Indonesia, uh, where the technique and um, pattern uh, is mostly known to originate from. Um, but as our next speaker uh, would argue, Ibu Lilawati, um, she says uh, batik uh, actually as uh, a dynamic uh, visual and cultural um, language um, that is responsive to the modernity and changes uh, in the, society, the current society. And it evolves through time um, and changes in technology and um, how, yeah, how the society moves. So um, with this mention, I would like to invite Ibu Lila to show, yeah. Hi, Ibu Lila. Hi. So um, Ibu Lila uh, is a professor in the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Indonesia. Uh, her research interests focus on cultural studies, uh, diaspora, and issues surrounding transculturality. Her current um, focus is situated within the context of heritage and modernity discourse, as well as the role of institutions and communities play in the everyday life of Indonesia. Um, so I would like to hear more about this um, idea of Batik as a language that is not static. Um, so moving away from the heritage to this um, uh, yeah, mo modern um, uh, culture. So uh, the floor is yours, Ibulila. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to this really uh, exciting uh, discussion. Uh, we are now in Indonesia in Jakarta is eight o'clock p.m. So good evening to Indonesia. <coughs> so I just began my uh, presentation uh, for today. Uh, next, as you can see, the title is Reading Batik. And in my line of work, I also uh, read many texts. And text in this case is not only text that you have on paper or you read on your laptop, but text is actually everything that can be read, that can be read. That means that you can analyze and put a meaning in your world not only written, but also ver verbal and visual. If we look at the social media like Instagram, for example, 
we could realize that our world has moved towards more visualized text. Text can also come from the word of textile and batik is a textile in broader sense. Next. <clears throat> the following batiks I want to explore with you is the so-called people's batik or batik rakyat. It is what ordinary people wears every day, not the antique ones and not the premium ones that uh, was shown, for example, by Sabina, all those beautiful and really intricate uh, patterns of batik. But this is a batik that was wear by ordinary people, so middle class people. And because it is worn and shown to the public, to the public, this batik contains more materials for interpretation of many aspects in the history of Indonesia. Van Dartel, 2005, for example, examines batik collections at the Tropen Museum Amsterdam. Batik that was brought home by the Dutch when they all, when they all had to return home. In her analysis, Van Dartel explains how the Dutch who were initially sent to the Dutch in this East Indies, the name of Indonesia during the colonial period, had to deal with completely new things. The officers who came first to Dutch East Indies still wanted to maintain their culture in the colony, but over time, they were actually influenced by their new environment. They began to adopt and appreciate but the clothes as part of fashion. Likewise, wives, their wives who were married in the Netherlands and had to accompany their husbands, even though they wanted to continue running a Dutch style household, they also have to adopt it to wearing batik clothes for daily fashion. Therefore, Van Dartel in his conclusion said that batik is not just a piece of cloth, but also a space that is the Indish space, a term that describes the entire cross-culture between the Netherlands and the archipelago and forms a new culture that is equally enjoyed and disseminated by the people of Indonesia and the Dutch. So in this sense, Batik not only can be read, but also a space that accommodating not only one culture, but many culture. Next. So this is a batik uh, that were given the title Tanah Tumpah Dara. This is the discourse of Indo United Indonesia from Sabang to Merauke, our homeland. The Patria was a slogan that was taught in primary school in the archipelago. We have to sacrifice ourselves to guard our motherland from others. This batik show the map of Indonesia with the new province of West Irian. The headline of this batik, Tumpah Darah Kita, sacrifice our blood for Indonesia. This batik was created in the time when the issue of Irian Jaya in the discourse of United Indonesia was circulated. This batik lawasan or old batiks are the collection of Mr. Hartono Sumarsono, a unique collector who does not only collects the premium quality batiks, but also everyday batiks like this one and the following batiks I will uh, try to show, which can be found around Jakarta, mostly in Karet, the center production of middle to low qualities, mostly chop or stamp batik. I was intrigued and also amazed during our discussion where Pak Hatono showed me his unique collection. I realized that batik has so much to reveal to us and every time I learned something new from our predecessor and ancestor. Slide five. This is a very unique batik. During the height of badminton events in the 60s, with athletes like Ferry Sonofil, Tan Yuhok, Mulyadi, and so forth, and also in the 70s, uh, if you can remember, Rudy Hartono and Lim Swicking, 
the Thomas Cup was a very prestige winning for Indonesia. Indonesia has shown the strongest and skillful athletes to the world. Indonesia must be reckoned to be one of the athletes in the international platform. The Batik artisan who made this was the wife of uh, TTT, the, the owner of the Batik workshop. Pak Hartono shared his interviews with the daughter of TTT. The creator, also the wife of Mr. TTT, was in the crowd during the celebration of coming home the first time both badminton cups brought to Indonesia. And looking at the cup, she got the inspiration to make this batik. Next. This is also very unique batik. Asian Games. Uh, Indonesia in that time built uh, in Senayan, Gelora Bung Karno complex. And also the boulevard surrounding it, you can see in the batik. If you can see also the uh, Semanggi uh, uh, at the bottom of the Batiks. Asian Games began in 1951 in New Delhi. The fourth Asian Games was held in Jakarta in 1962. Notable was the expulsion of Israel and Taiwan from the Games. This resulted the expulsion of Indonesia by IOC in Olympic Games in Tokyo, 1964. President Sukarno was very furious and immediately formed a counter games which named Ganefo. Next. This batik has no direct correlation with Asian Games, was, but was titled Asian Games. Maybe it was made in the spirit of the first Asian Games which held in Jakarta. The spirit of move, movements towards a new emerging republic and a new nation that inhabit the archipelago. Sukarno was one of the founding fathers who was concerned about building the nation as one and moving towards an international recognition. <laughs> I'm very sorry, I have already teached two classes today. So my voice is my voice is a little bit, you know. Okay, next. <clears throat> This batik was named Ganefo, Games of the New Emerging Forces. This is the name given both to the games held in Jakarta in 1963 and 36 members supporting the federation established in the same year. So Kano, um, while hearing about the expulsion of Indonesia from the Olympic uh, games in 1964 in five days, he has already formed Ganefo. A second Ganefo scheduled for Cairo in 1967 was canceled. And Ganefo had only one subsequent even an Asian Ganefo held in Phnom Penh in 1966. Next. <coughs> this batik is also very unique and very interesting. Uh, this batik was named Nasapom. Nasionalisme, Agama, dan Komunis. Since the beginning of struggle for Indonesian independence, three political currents have been known that colored the various movement organization of that era. For example, the Indicio Party and, and the Nationalists, the Sarekat Islam with an Islamic ideology, and PKI with the Marxist ideology. According to Sukarno, I quote, Nationalism, Islam, and Marxism, these are the principles that people's movement toward Asia hold firmly. These are the ideas that have become the spirit of these movements in Asia. The spirit is also the movement in Indonesia ours. Next, two batiks which name Dwikora and Trikora. Operation Dwikora or Dwi Komando Rakyat was President Sukarno's command, which was carried out as a response to the plan from, to form the Malaysian Federation. In the 1960s, the Federation of Malaya wanted to incorporate the territories of Singapore, Brunei, Sarawak, Malaya, and Sabah into 
its territory, which was supported by the British. Because it was again the Manila Agreement, President Sukarno issued Operation Ricora with the aim of thwarting plans for the establishment of the Federation of Malaysia. Next, Operation Tricora or Tri Commando Rakyat was a military operation launched by Indonesia to fight against the Dutch occupation of West Irian or Papua. This operation began in December 1961 and ended in 1962. This operation ended with the defeat of the Indonesian military in several areas of Dutch New Guinea and the surrender of West Irian by the Dutch to become part of Indonesia through Yuntea. Next, this is the last uh, slide from the uh, old batiks, which was in the collection of Pahartono uh, Sumarsono. Two batiks with prominent women uh, name on the batik. One is Megawati, our fifth president, and Butin or Tin Suharto, our former first lady of the second president. Megawati now is the chairperson of PDIP, the National Democratic Party, and still active in the politics. Both women have their own share in the politics. Both are strong women, but each has a different interest. Now I will look at the, pop, uh, at the popular batik, which was nowadays, for example, uh, we have the freedom to design and to decide what we want on the batik which I have also done uh, for several times. The next slide. This is a batik of Power Rangers. As you see, Power Rangers is a popular culture, um, a series which was uh, very well known uh, with the teens and also the, the children. I have designed this Power Rangers batik with the Garudas and the Isen uh, Truntum. This is my own design and made in Pekalongan by Batik Workshop Mustar Siddiq. Next, this is my favorite cartoon, Doraemon, which is also made in Pekalongan by Batik Workshop Mustar Siddiq. Now I will show how our young generation, young designer, uh, mix some part of batiks with others uh, materials and they try to uh, uh, to form a new batik which was uh, very uh, how do you put it very youthful uh, outcome the first is batik amarilis owner Shelly Tambunan and has already international marketing and that's why it is very pricey for us. Most of he, uh, her attire uh, is really very expensive for us. For example, one attire costs 3 million rupees. Most of the international customers from, from uh, Batik Amarilis come from South Africa. Next slide is Batik Sinaran, a subtler design in pastels and Batik motifs that is new and modern. Batik Sinaran targeted for middle level income. Next one, Batik from Sukoharjo, Central Java, unique design using the grown templates of Kaung and Lurik, fresh, youthful, and joyful, targeted also for middle level income, young and vibrant colors for youngsters in uh, our modern time. So, that is my, okay, this is <laughs> appropriation, but in a positive way. Uh, Salam dari Indonesia. Thank you very much for your attention. And I give back to Adis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mulila. That was, that was amazing. I've never, yeah, I've never seen Batik um, in this uh, Dora M1 or Power Rangers and also, um, the use for uh, political campaigns <laughs> as well. So uh, I would also like to say thank you for Pahartono. I'm, I'm sad that he 
is not able to join us here, but a lot of the batik that you just shown is from his um, collection. And um, well, I now we have uh, listened to three of our esteemed presenters today, and I can see that um, a lot of people also eager to uh, give comments and um, questions in the chat box. But before we do that, I'm wondering, I want to invite Mas Ardi, our junior curator from Museum Textile Indonesia to share his thought from um, these three uh, very engaging and illuminating uh, topics. Um, so Mas Ardi, uh, what do you think so far? And if you, yeah, if you, have any questions as well to discuss in the floor? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Adis. And I would like, to, uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Headship Museums, Mel, Adis, for this amazing webinar and all the fantastic speakers, Sabine, Amanda, and Ibu Lila. Uh, first of all, I'm uh, Ardi Hariadi. I'm junior curator from Jakarta Textile Museums, Adis. So we are based in Jakarta which collect and exhibit Indonesian tech, traditional textiles, not only batik, but also woven fabrics such as ikat, ulos, songket, and some other Indonesian woven textiles. And our uh, current collections is uh, around 3,000 pieces, and a thousand of them are batik from all over Indonesia. And most of them are donated from private collector, textile lovers, and museum partners. So uh, there's a lot of information from the three speakers that are fantastic. But if you talk about batik, some expert felt that batik was originally reserved as an art from Japanese royalty because certain patterns were reserved to be worn only by royalty from the Karaton. But this is very debatable because some experts believe that batik is an important part of the community because a young lady's accomplishment that she be capable to nyanting or making batik with a reasonable amount of skill, certainly as important as cookery and other housewifery arts to central Japanese women. And as mentioned by the speakers, batik is a technique of decorating cloth textile using hot wax with chanting. This is uh, the pen-like instruments used to apply wax to the cloth in the coloring dyeing process, where all the processes are done by hand. So the fake batik, or we can call it the uh, motif batik fabric, it's not actually batik. So we have to emphasize that batik is a technique, it's not an, a form of uh, mo uh, words just describing about techniques because the wide diversity of patterns reflects a variety of influences, just like Sabine presented. But I think it's a trading commodity ranging from Arabic calligraphy, European bouquet, ornaments, and culture, such as Red Riding Hood, but I think Sabine presented, and Chinese phoenixes to the Japanese cherry blossoms, and Indian or Persian peacock. And it's very intriguing me because. Uh, I have a question uh, actually for Sabine, because the term of batik Belanda is very different with any other batik. We do not have uh, batik China, batik India, or batik Jepang, but we do have batik Belanda. Is it a part of glorifying Dutch coloni colonizer, or is it part of glorifying the colony? So that's the first question for Sabine, if you uh, have any answer to that. So Adis? You want right away a response? <laughs> oh, go ahead, um, Sabine. Response right away. Yeah, so um, when Feldhuizer coined the term Batik Belanda, uh, Feldhuizer is no longer with us. So um, um, I have to guess why he coined specifically Batik Belanda to describe um, this style of Batik. Um, at that time, I think, um, because if you look in this time frame uh, when the imitations came on the market, it's also the time frame that the European influence become uh, visible in Batik. So he might have just made a mistake and used the term Batik Belanda uh, for the actual Batiks. Um, um, the name was actually a local name on Java, Batik Belanda, to specifically uh, imply that it was imitation Batiks. So everyone was well aware that it was not real Batik, that it was not made with a wax resist. Um, and it, yeah, it's kind of 
uh, said that today um, we use this term to describe an influence in Batik, um, which I also would like to debate that was not specifically made for European or Indo-European women because it was worn throughout Southeast Asia by also yeah. Peranakan Chinese. It was very popular in Singapore and Malaysia. So um, he not only misused the term, but he also um, racialized a part of Batik culture uh, by making uh, it, giving it the name Dutch Batik. So these are multiple things that we still need to uh, dive into, I think. So please okay. continue with your questions. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, Sabine. And uh, uh, yeah, Adis, uh, batik is often handed down within families for generations. The craft of batik is intertwined with cultural identity of Indonesian people. And through the symbolic meanings of its color and designs, expresses their creativity and spirituality. And uh, for, from the presentation of Ibulila, Ibulila actually Pak Hartono is one of our uh, most favorite colleague because his collection is magnificent. And uh, yeah, it's uh, his collection is several times being exhibited in the textile museums. And yes, but it has become part of the society. So we are not only talking about traditions or the past, but also about the present and the future. And like Bu Lila presented, currently many Indonesian designers are also starting to look at batik to become part of their creations. And uh, maybe this is a, a very uh, simple question, but it's very hard to do, Bu Lila. Uh, and I have a, a question for Ibu Lila. How can young people want to make batik as part of their lives? not only the obligations that are imposed on them, for example, school uniforms, because right now the youngsters is only using like, if you have to wear it, you have to wear it, but it's not like from their heart to wear antibiotics. Is there any suggestion for Ibulila to make youngsters to make the batik is part of their lives? Well, yes, I sh have shown uh, my design you can uh, say the popular culture batik. And this is uh, already attracted uh, many uh, of my students, for example, because they have never uh, thought that batik could be like that. Yeah, in their mind, batik is like, you know, para or cow yeah. or whatever. So I showed them and they, they like it. So they were very eager to know how. And in our... Uh, in UI, there is a liberal arts, you know, uh, and one of these uh, section was art and they can choose batik. So many of the uh, students in UI are also learning batik. So, um, well, what we call klowongan, you know, yeah, only yeah. The, 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 the ground. Uh, yeah. of it. But they learn so it. Yeah, but they learn it. So uh, if you can choose between, you know, anime and yeah. batik, yeah? so uh, they are learning it. So uh, I always say that uh, we have to encourage the youngsters to love batik by doing some like a uh, new design and not afraid to combine batik with other uh, elements of textiles, textile which I have shown. Uh, very dynamic uh, because the young people likes dynamic things. So, um, well, it is very, <laughs> I always complaining. Why are the, uh, the so-called, uh, you know, uh, Pemda, yeah, Pemda, Pemda, all over Indonesia uh, seems like lacking, you know, like lagging, uh, okay, Batik or Tenun or whatever. It is not our concern. This is very, uh, very wrong you have to uh, begin to introduce the curriculum in the school. So yeah. from, uh, from young age, they have learned about this. And I have also learned uh, very hard to, to take chanting batik, yeah? Mm -hmm. And I have um, went to Timor uh, to do research on Tenun and so on. So I think if you try to put the curriculum in Campus Merdeka or whatever, will uh, support things uh, better. I think that's all, Mas Ardi. 
if I might <laughs> okay, take you back you. from your question, Mas Adi, and uh, your response, Ibumila. Um, this is also something that connects to uh, one of our uh, audience um, question, which is how, uh, for Sabine, um, how how it the importance of mixing uh, this research in but this because I really uh, also highlighted um, this encouragement of, uh, to look at batik as something that is malleable. It's not. It's it's not a, a static thing. It's not just um, um, heirloom that the young people or just if we remember again, put back to that period where uh, a lot of Dutch designers um, during that time experiment with batik. Um, so yeah, how to engage in it and, and how do you uh, uh, position yourself as an artist, but also as a researcher in this uh, kind of activism. Uh, this is a question from a lot of Karaman. I hope I can tie yeah. that down nicely. Um, so yeah, I have my Instagram uh, as first description, Batik Activist. Um, I must say this is a badge of honor that was given to me by people on Java because um, I'm very outspoken about the imitations, the fakes that flood the Indonesian market and are very um, devastating in a, in a way for the real handmade batik. Um, this is not just a problem in Java, it's also here in the Netherlands, uh, a lot of brands that use batik, but then only use imitations uh, and not explain this well to their audience. So this, um, yeah, education is a education is a big part of this. Um, uh, of course, I use my blog, my own platforms to discuss this, but it's also something I discuss with batik makers, researchers, people on Java itself. Um, like, how can we help? What can we do? Uh, what do, <laughs> do we need to tell people better? And um, yeah, it's a work in process. Um, for example, I'm simply always wearing real batik myself, um, showing how fun it is, how nice it is. Um, but in my research, um, I think the most part I'm working on is there has been a lot of Dutch researchers in the past who dominated the field a lot, but they never took the time to either um, let all Dutch documents be translated or make things digitally available or bring really this um, huge um, uh, part of, of uh, yeah, important data for Indonesia back to Indonesia. So a large part of my research is also working on making this available for either researchers in Indonesia or of course the Pembatics themselves to get inspiration from the Batics we keep here in collections uh, to, yeah, to use freely in this. Masar, you have any thought and also continue your comment, please. I'm sorry, I kind of interject over there. It's, it's okay, Adis. And uh, like Bulila said, it's, it's a kind of like modern batik, right? But although uh, we, if we talk about modern batik, it's very strong ties with traditional batik. It utilizes linear treatment or on, of ornaments, flowers, or animals, or like the pop culture that Bulela said about it. And Svatik tend to be more dependent on designer and rather than the stiff guidelines that have guided traditional craftsmen. But modern batik must be utilizing the chanting and chop to create intricate designs. But if you use only batik motifs in art or contemporary work, right work to use is batik motif, not batik itself. This can be done for the sake of preservation. So it's 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 very okay in my opinion and not defeated from the meaning of batik, which is required to use techniques with hot wax and chanting or stems. This hot wax is uh, particularly made for batik. So it's specially made. It's not only just wax, but, but there's a, uh, uh, a lot of materials in it. So we call it like the Japanese wax for batiks. And the chanting and or stamps, it's usually used for the techniques. So uh, this is also a question for Amanda because uh, the exhibition is very, uh, it's very wonderful. But uh, the question is, are Dutch people, especially artists currently this, uh, this day, also appreciating Dutch co collections inspired 
because some other questions also talk about in Spark, not appropriation by the Indonesian culture. Is it uh, still the artists, especially in uh, the Netherlands, is also appreciating those collections inspired by the Indonesian culture? That's a really good question, actually. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if they are inspired by the, the Dutch Batik objects, for example, that I showed in the room, but I very much know um, because this research that I'm doing, my PhDs, that there is a lot of artists here in the Netherlands that have um, that are diaspora from Indonesia look at Indonesian objects that they want to activate in their art and um, really look at yeah how to how can they again um, you know, get entangled with their heritage from their diasporic roots. So I do see that a lot. So I also did an exhibition um, recently with um, Hatu Tamele, James Noya, and he remade a saluvaku because he really much wants to um, keep the wood cutting uh, techniques alive here in the Netherlands for his uh, generation and younger people. So I'm not actually sure if they, uh, if if young artists here are inspired by the Dutch batik objects. That's something I should uh, research. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so back to you, Addis. Yeah, thank you so much for um, bringing up the question also, Mas Ardi. And this is, I think this also ties to um, two questions uh, posed by Barbara Purba and Tamara Klopper uh, in our audience. Um, on this uh, question about between why use appropriation? Because as we see the examples that Sabine showed, um, the uh, Snow White uh, Batik and also from Ibulila, um, from you know Indonesia, the government as well used this technique, but for something completely um, different from uh, the so-called uh, classical uh, Kratan Batik. Um, so where to draw the line between this uh, influence and inspiration and, and uh, tied to that, uh, Tamara Klopper also asked, um, can we uh, still uh, use, uh, but why do we still uh, call these objects that is not necessarily on textiles? So this cabinet would work um, as uh, batik. So yeah, yeah, do you have any thought on that? Uh, perhaps Amanda? Yeah, I think maybe it's really good to first um, define the term appropriation mm -hmm. like yeah. how do we see the term appropriation for all of us um well I, i've written it down here as uh, the use of objects symbols images techniques of a non-dominant culture in ways that pay um, not per se that much regard to the original meaning or purpose and are used for profit and there's another uh, definition as well which actually comes from ashcroft privet and tiffin from the post-colonial studies the key concepts which say the process, so appropriation is defined as the process by which colonial power incorporates aspects of the colony in their culture, trade, and also for profit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important because what we see, what uh, Sabine shows us, of course, there is this um, uh, Indonesian people or Prakan Chinese that also wear the, the batiks that were made by Dutch or Indo-Dutch well, designed, let's say. <laughs> we don't know if they're always made by them. Um, but that's very different, I think, because we have to look at the, the power dynamics. And that's mm -hmm. where, what I when I say appropriation, it's really the Dutch appropriating the technique. So the colonizer appropriating techniques of the colonized. And that's where I see this big difference. Mm -hmm. So removing oh. the, the initial... Um intention of the, the technique into something that just focus on making profits that's yeah and of and of course with the designers that we show mm -hmm. it's not only always for profit it's of course also the artistic uh value that they have but mm -hmm. it's always in yeah you know it's still they are more privileged mm -hmm. they can actually find batik and see it and use the technique and um, I also saw uh, Tamara's question. Hi, Tamara. <laughs> Tamara and I, we know each other. <laughs> Tamara actually did this amazing research on the Bochman um, uh, piece. So if there's any questions about that, maybe Tamara has even someone who can answer that better. Um, but Tamara, you asked um, um, why 
or is it the Stelic Museum that says these designers and artists appropriated, or is this also already in um, in literature? So I think the literature that I found from the time that these pieces were made, it's more seen as well. Dutch people find it quite hard to criticize the Dutch, anyways. I think, but it's more seen as um, that these designers discovered batik, like Columbus discovered the Americas. You know, like it's something for them to discover and to find, um, which I don't agree with. But there is, for example, an article by uh, Abby uh, Lilleton. She's a professor at the University of Rhode Island. And she uh, wrote this article in, oh, now I don't know when, I think in 2004 already, where it says the Javanese effect, appropriation of batik and its transformation in modern textile. So it's maybe, I think people now more see it in this way because now they see it as, um, well, like I said, there was a different power balance. So I think maybe now it's seen more as appropriation than back then. And of I course- add something. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. the, 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 uh, there was even in the Netherlands a Batik laboratory made to study Batik. Uh, it's in Haarlem, not, no? Not just, in yeah, Haarlem. In Haarlem, not yeah. just the technique, but also all the dyes. And this was um, um, at the time uh, set up to, to help uh, the Batik culture in Indonesia because they thought it was in decline because of synthetic uh, dyes coming on the market, which also came from Europe. Um, and um, they made these labs to kind of protect or something, the culture, but it was mostly used by Dutch artists, this lab. So, the, um, and then these Dutch artists went also back to Java to teach <laughs> Batik again on Java. So it's a very interesting um, mm -hmm. and complicated time where indeed, um, yeah, I think uh, what Amanda says about the choice of words is very correct. So, um, yeah. But yeah, I think it, was, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> of course, it was to help in Indonesian batik industry, which profited the Dutch. You know, like it's like mm. that. And yeah. also, you know, I did I looked at literature. So, for example, there's um, an Elsa Fears that's but it was a monthly journal, still is I think, from 1903, and it's an article which is called about batik work in the Netherlands. And it starts with saying, it may be certainly be called remarkable that we Dutch, especially in the field of art, so much more higher developed than the Imborlinge, so the ab aboriginals yeah. of our East Indonesian's possessions, still had to go there to learn one of the most beautiful decorative arts of present time. So it really, I think we really have to realize that in the time that Le Beau, Cachet made their works, this is how Indonesian people were regarded. Mm. That's why I said there was a violent um, power dynamic going on. That's, and that's what I wanted to show as a Stelic Museum, that we have to definitely can value the artistic pieces, just like Picasso, but we can look at the, the views of the artists themselves. And on that note, Amanda, I think you also touched on, uh, kind of transitioning it very nicely uh, to my question. Um, then. You've, you've given an example on how museums kind of take role in, in, in developing this narrative through the way that you exhibit or the way that you curate and present the narrative surrounding collections that you have. Um, yeah, so I, I, I would like to, to um, listen both from you and also from Ardi because you're also uh, working uh, uh, you know, as, the, as an institution um, where's the role of, of the museum um, in, in proliferating uh, these views to the public? How, how do you engage I mean, then uh, as this cabinet of curiosities and in a very, as you mentioned, a one dimensional idea of, of um, heritage or, or art objects or culture? And now we arrive uh, in, in a um, discourse that is more open. We, we talk about this appropriation, inspiration. It's very, there's, uh, in my opinion, there's no um, uh, correct, it's, it's not as simple as a black and white situation. Um, so yeah, uh, if you have any thought, Ardi and Amanda. Um, Ardi, would you like to go first? Because I've been talking a lot, I think. <laughs> 
Okay. So. Sorry, my connection is uh, not really that well. Yeah. I just could you please, would you mind to have your questions? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, where do you see the place and role of the museum in both communicating, but also shaping this public perception surrounding uh, your own collection, because uh, as Amanda show example, there's progression of how uh, museums in the Netherlands construct narrative uh, surrounding um, objects from other cultures. But yeah, um, how about in Muslim textile or based on your own, um, I think, critique uh, to the uh, situation? Okay, the textile museums is all, uh, all only collects the Indonesian textiles and several textiles from uh, any other countries. So we are only uh, exhibiting our own collections and from the private collectors across Indonesia because uh, if I'm not mistaken and I believe we are having like the international exhibition is only for the e uh, Southeast Asian countries and we haven't yet uh, go with the international uh, collections in our museum so we're uh, still uh, expecting that uh, the traditional ones is uh, uh, it's a bridge to the youngsters that uh, uh must be known about the batik itself because uh as you can see like uh batik is a very like intricate uh, things to do it's very hard to do sometimes one piece of batik is takes like months to make uh three and six months so it we are still reshaping that batik it's a very uh simple by doing the simple thing like ibu lilas do with the uh, pop cultures and it's not really that uh, traditional ones because the traditional one is like I said, it's very expensive and it's uh, it's very uh, hard to do for the youngsters. So what we do in our museums is uh, just, uh, we have the gallery batik to uh, exhibit all across Indonesian batiks in uh, our museums. And uh, for the uh, actual doing, which is uh, they, we do have the workshops place to make batiks. So everybody that come to museums can do batiks. And uh, we are expecting that uh, once they are doing their own batiks, uh, they can feel how the artisan makes one piece of batik. So the actual uh, batik uh, process and uh, at the end of the day, batik is very expensive. They can taught by themselves because uh, once uh, they do 30 by 30 centimeters of cloth, it's taking like 30 minutes. So how they can make like two and a half meters long for making batik. So mm -hmm. they, their perspective and uh, what they feel about batiks and uh, the appreciation about batik is more likely uh, developed by uh, the museum doing. So this, we are not only uh, exhibit the batik, but mm -hmm. we also uh, make a batik workshops that uh, all the visitors of textile museums can do. So maybe that's the our reshaping uh, batik because yeah, nowadays batik is uh, still lacking of the youngsters to make, and yeah, mm -hmm. uh, as 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 far we know that in the uh, like I, I I've been told Sabin before because it's very unfortunate because the Indonesian batik collection in the Netherlands is more largely than in the Indonesia, so. Yeah, it's very unfortunate, but also uh, fortunate because uh, the, the the Dutch people is more uh, what we call is more aware of the history, is more aware of the uh, part of their uh, yeah the part of their history, so they are well uh, preserved and well 
Brighton and yeah, it's uh, that's the the positive things about the Indonesian batik. It's more largely collect in the Netherlands rather than Indonesia. So maybe that's our that's my thought about the matters. Yeah, I guess uh, what you highlighted is that uh, there's an approach which is more interactive in its nature that a museum can take part of um, disseminating this or strengthening the connection. Uh, between the audience, or in this case, the um, the people uh, where you know this technique originated from. So uh, moving beyond um, static exhibition or text or or yeah, academic research. So bringing that experiential element back to connection between the pub uh, the the public and the um, cultural materials itself. Um, so. And how about uh, your take, Amanda, as a researcher, as a curator, but also, um, yeah, um, a state like museum? Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, you were just talking about um, the cabinets of curiosity, for example, and well, the state like museum, I said it's it opened in 1895, so it was very much also a colonial institution. And we really want to research also now this, our history. So um, we did a research in who paid for our bricks, for example, <laughs> like where, you know, where does this come from? And also we have to face the truth that in uh, two years before the Stalic opened on the same square, on the museum plan, museum square, people from Indone Indonesia were showcased as in like human zoos. So it's, it's, it's a very problematic history. And I think it's only fair in finally 2022, 23 to to do more research about what our institution is and to find out what the future can be. And that's why I said, like, I don't believe that we can't show these objects in our in our presentations anymore, but that we have to show them in a different in a different way. And that we also have to think about um, belonging, like who can feel safe and who can feel like they belong within an institution in the Netherlands, um, which I think is very important, because um, if you look at the the ecom definition for museums it says like an institution has to be open to public and inclusive and accessible and I think then that whole idea of where where can I feel like I belong where can I feel like I'm being seen and mm -hmm. why where can I identify myself should also be a Stalic museum and the Stalic museum is maybe also a bit of a weird institution as we have um, modern art and design collection and also very much contemporary art but in that way, we can actually broaden that narrative. So that's why I really like to sort of put in this sort of trans historical position. So I'll show a Flisco or the, the new works by Farida Sadok that tie this all together. Um, yeah, so more people can can also read their own narrative in the exhibition. Yeah, I think that's a, one of the positive trends that I see happening all over uh, museum here in the Netherlands is that uh, moving away from this um, linear uh, narrative, a way of mm -hmm. um, presenting objects from the collection to uh, what, yeah, the example that you uh, showcased, um, just connecting a lot of different uh, points of departure from objects that doesn't necessarily will be in the room together, maybe mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years ago. But uh, under this overarching idea of okay, the the social political situation of that time. So um, every everyone that comes to these spaces can then find their own connection points to either the narrative or the objects or just the um, and again I have to borrow this term cross pollination that happened there uh, or the the lack thereof. But yeah, it's it's uh, I think the 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 current trend is very uh, interesting to see um, how we move, uh, move forward from this. Um, and I would also like to uh, highlight, there's a comment uh, in the chat uh, from Unita Dwi Adisaputri. Uh, I think uh, this is a response also to the comment that uh, was made by Ardi Vashidwi, the Batik is term uh, for uh, you know the wax painting technique. Um, it's uh, art or fashion, and it have a poten potential to grow dynamically, uh, as opposed to being freeze into this idea of the heirloom. This is the certain way to do batik. This is the certain definition of batik. 
I think this also uh, connects nicely to um, why we can still regard, um, say, objects that uh, was designed by Bachmann, for example, we can still call them um, you know, uh, using batik technique because I think he, he did, uh, in fact, uh, use a wax resist uh, in, in the way that he uh, created these decorations. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember that I have a question for Ivo Lila and also Sabine. Oh, um, yeah, I think um, reeling back to uh, still in this, in this um, uh, discussion about inspiration and uh, belonging or ownership, um, I noticed that Ibu Lila, you uh, show uh, Batik Amarilis in your presentation. And in there, it's, it's uh, another uh, interesting example, uh, in my opinion, because I know that Batik Amarilis combines uh, Batik, a technique, but also Hungarian, um, how do you call it, the, the, the name of the technique? Um, embroidery, embroidery. Yeah, Hungarian embroidery. So in this case, um, there's no, I think, um, a direct colonial relationship between Indonesia and Hungary. Um, where do you place this? Is this, can we say, inspiration, appropriation, based on yeah, the discussion that we just uh, bring up between Sabine and Amanda? What do you think of this? Um. <clears throat> okay, first, uh, I don't think that it is Hungarian. Maybe oh. because you are in the Europe, European yeah. area, so you thought mm -hmm. that it is Hungarian, but it is also uh, Latinos, uh, the South American. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, because if you see Frida Kahlo, Frida Kahlo wears always so many uh, um, um, colorful things and also embroidery things. So. I might say that it is more South uh, America. Mm -hmm. And if I saw the, the customer from Batik Amarilis, uh, there are also people from South uh, America who, who already been their customer. So one piece of uh, attire cost a 3 million rupiah that is really um, very expensive, very pricey mm -hmm. for us. So uh, the Batik Amarilis also uh, cater to international. And embroidery is also, uh, well, formerly when I was a little girl, maybe, uh, this is not uh, um, very often to see that people wearing uh, clothes with embroidery because embroidery is still practiced in, in Tasikmalaya and so on. So you can find it, bordir, so bordir, yeah, uh, embroidery. Uh, but nowadays it is in Indonesian very uh, difficult to find such fine, and vibrant colors uh, embroidery. You can see it in the uh, kebaya, for example, many kebaya with bordier uh, with embroidery, but not so in this sense. So mm. if I, I look at Amarilis, I always remember Frida Kahlo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's why they have a lot of uh, customer from South America. Mm. And I think this is a, uh, how do you put it? Uh, how young people uh, try to uh, try to to form a new batik. Mm. Uh, they still use the uh, old template because if I see they they use kawung and so on. But uh, how do you put it in Indonesia? We say tabrak, yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah, just classing uh, colors, classing all the 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 motifs and. I like it because this is uh, how young people should actually creatively uh, making something. Yes, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think that's all. Sabine, you're welcome to if you have any additions to that. You want me to? Uh, how is this applied morally in fashion or? Yeah, in in the current um, artistic, I guess the, the source of inspiration. Uh, yeah. Yeah, as an artist yourself. Yeah, so for me, um, I was researching batik before I wore it. I didn't feel I should wear it because I'm Dutch and I didn't know what I would bring out when wearing batik. Uh, um, communication kind of thing. Then I was in Indonesia and a lot of people said, like, oh, you're so proud about batik and you share so much about it. Why don't you wear it? 
And um, the batik makers explained to me that they are making a lot of batiks now that are um, freer of design, freer of color, uh, that are um, made in a simpler motif or less color use so that they can be cut into shirts or dresses. And um, actually a lot of the makers I know specifically tailor uh, their clothing or their batiks uh, for clothing. Uh, only a few uh, where make the traditional sarong like I have here behind me. Um, so um, yeah, for the make, uh, it's very um, daily practice to, to make it to wear. Um, I think um, mainly the market now for batik goes to like place like Jakarta and and uh, Singapore um, are big <laughs> wearers of Indonesian batik. Um, while um, yeah, throughout Indonesia is becoming less and less. Uh, but there are interesting fashion brands. Um, but also like what I do myself, I always just go to a local tailor with a batik I bought and make it into something fitting for me because um, although I love the Indonesian brands, they often tend to be for little women <laughs> and the sleeves and everything would be too short for me. So um, I often um, yeah make the pieces when I'm there. Uh, but I'm now wearing a piece by a uh, Dutch brand, Guave, who also works with uh, Batik uh, next to textiles from uh, the Netherlands uh, to celebrate their uh, heritage, which is both uh, in the European. Um, so they have Batik and uh, Dutch textiles in their collections. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess you, you also bring this important picture that Batik is as uh, Bolin also brought up uh, before, batik is more of a space uh, that you know many cultural interaction and interpretation can exist. So yes, there's this um, uh, ceremonial, more classical batik. I guess Bolin Masari also have in in their collection that uh, have rules around them, but that doesn't mean it applies to um, the rest of batik. That it's, it's a, I think there there there'll be an interplay between this uh, respect of those that uh, yeah exist in, in more of the traditional the ceremonial, but it doesn't mean that the the cultural material itself uh, exists only in that space. Um, it evolves with time, as uh, Ibuli mentioned, and um, I think being very aware of the time, I actually would like to invite Mela. <laughs> Or uh, maybe if you have a reflection, just to bring this back uh, to um, Amsterdam School uh, in this topic and uh, the Amsterdam School designers and what you have uh, showcased uh, in the exhibition itself. And also a reminder, uh, anyone that is in Amsterdam or the Netherlands, you can still visit the exhibition until uh, August. Um, yeah, if you would like to take this chance, Mela, for your um, um, final remarks. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I have listened to uh, all of your conversation with much uh, interest. And uh, I have actually so many uh, questions still for every one of you. Uh, it's, it's, it's nice to see and also unique to see that so many people involved in presenting Batik, uh, making Batik, uh, thinking about Batik, are now here together um, on also Indonesian uh, museums and Dutch museums. So I think this is, yeah, this is wonderful to, to see. Um, yeah, I, I honestly, when I was, uh, yeah, thinking about how to go about the, 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 let's say the Batik team that we have developed in the exhibition, it was quite, um, yeah, I struggled quite a lot with it because it's, you know, the, Amanda already talked about this, this issue of power, which is uh, clearly present in this uh, uh, period. And um, at the same time, I also wanted to show that uh, Baltic is not just, um, just, a, just a craft that has been used by Dutch artists in this way, but also show that Batik is something still alive and still, uh, yeah, very much, um, yeah, living culture. 
Um, and also that uh, not, yeah, the Dutch artists don't get all the credit for ma for making what they make. So this is also what I, yeah, had to 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 challenge when making this 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 theme in the exhibition. And yeah, I, I sort of wanted then to have Amsterdam school objects next to um, Indonesian objects, and I actually, yeah, made it. As such that when you are a visitor you you walk uh into the room uh and you first encounter the whole uh story about indonesian batik and there we stress that it's it's a technique that goes back uh yeah until uh before before the christ <laughs> for uh yeah a long time ago and um then then the visitor is led to the to the next part where you see uh, how Dutch artists in the yeah early 20th century were using it, and uh, yeah, because our focus was of course on the Amsterdam School, not on the, the the Art Nouveau or the Nieuwe Kunst. So this is also this part of yeah, yeah, sort of making a more de decolonial approach where you at once show the colonial dimensions in this in this uh, process, but also. A little bit take it take it away from it because it has been always contextualized as such um and and yeah i think that um yeah i'm, I'm also very curious uh, but maybe that's we can speak about it later are you or maybe you can respond quite quickly because you said like well um there is this uh yeah the, the, that the dutch uh, collections house many buttocks that actually uh, in Indonesia are not there anymore, not in your museums. Is there actually any contact between you and Dutch museums to sort of bring this knowledge and bring the objects maybe also to Indonesia because they have such value for, for you in your history? And another question might be, um, yeah, we have in the Netherlands these these so-called Dutch design objects that's of the Amsterdam School, but also of the Art Nouveau. And how how do you look upon these? How do you what what should be maybe more concrete? What should be interested in showing them? And how would you show them in your museum? I mean, it's such a intricate history um, of interrelations. And yeah, I'm curious about to hear about this. But um, I don't know, Alice. Do we have time? <laughs> <laughs> maybe for yeah, a maybe. quick answer yeah quick answer yeah and Sabine is one of our colleagues uh, from the textile museum so Sabine is very helpful to the museums about the collections back in the Netherlands and we are so grateful to have Sabine as one of the researchers that having a good relationship with textile museums and of course we do want to have like a uh, corporations, exhibitions together with Sabine, because if I'm not mistaken, Sabine will be having a exhibitions back in Jakarta in the in the late year. So yeah, we are having like a good connection with the uh, uh, Netherlands museums, such as Tropen Museums, Rich Museums, because we do have uh, strong connections with the Netherlands, because yeah, uh, it, it's not arguable because all the collections in the Netherlands is very related to Indonesian. So we do have, uh, we have to uh, get a lot of uh, a big or a great connection with the Dutch museums or Dutch researchers such as Sabine. So maybe that's the answer, Mel. Yeah, so there's still a lot of, uh, yeah, building of this relationship and uh... Yeah, I, 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 I'm very curious to to see what what comes out of these uh, these connections and 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 join forces more than I've been in the past. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, I guess uh, then, Addis, it's up to me to also uh, uh, now close the the session. If uh, if you don't have any objections, oh, please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Well, this is a, a formal, but I, I, I do need to tell that, uh, yeah. Um, oh yeah, if you want to have a certificate for the webinar, you can email us at info at museum at schip dot nl. Um, so please do if you'd like to have a, a certificate. 
but also, of course, thank you to all the speakers and all the uh, people that uh, engaged in this discussion. Um, I think uh, it, it shows that we have not yet uh, said everything about this debate and it stands for a much larger, uh, yeah, uh, uh, entangled history that we need to uh, untangle. <laughs> Um, and um, yeah, all webinars are also um, made available online um, and you will find them on the page where you also uh, could be able to register uh, for the uh, webinar. And um, also you can uh, find our, our next webinar, which will be on Wednesday, June 7. And for this webinar, we will uh, speak about public housing in Indonesia and the Netherlands. As uh, people might know, the uh, museum at Schip is not only a museum for the Amsterdam school movement, but also for public housing, because public housing is uh, yeah, the reason for the emergence of this uh, building style at such a large uh, um, a scope. And uh, we will have three speakers. We have historian of urban planning, Pauline van Roosmalen. Uh, we have um, Elisa Sutandijaya of the Rujak Center for Urban Studies in Jakarta. And we will have uh, historian Abidin Kusno of York University. And uh, I also see somebody uh, um, present that will be commenting that is uh, Risky Kalobos. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's now waving, I see. <laughs> Hi, Risky. Uh, and uh, yeah, we of course hope to see you then. That will be also our last webinar. So um, yeah, uh, please join us. And uh, if um, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free also to uh, um, reach out to us at the same email at info at um, So uh, without further ado, I think uh, uh, we can close the session. Um, and um, I wish you all a very good evening if you're in Indonesia or a very good uh, afternoon when you are in uh, Europe. So um, thank you all. Thank you, Addis, as well for your moderating the session. And uh, I wish you uh, uh, a good future. <laughs>